Well, this morning we're at Shamrock Key Marina, which is on the River Itchen in Southampton. And today is a bit of a make and mend day. So uh, we've got the dinghy to get out, we've got the bilges to clean and the pumps to test, and we've got the engine bilge uh, to take uh, clean out and put a new uh, oil absorbency pad in. One job that we, uh, we must do regularly, even if we don't think it needs doing, uh, is keeping the bilges uh, washed and making sure the bilge pumps work, which is the reason you want to do it regularly. So what we're going to do is I'm going to put some bilge X, which is a detergent specially designed for marine bilges, uh, into the bilge, put some nice water in and then pump it out. And I'm going to pump it out using the electric pump and then fill it up again and then use the manual pump. And that means that I've checked both pumps. Then I can get a sponge and sponge the remainder out so that the bilges are dry and that we know we haven't got any leaks coming in. So here's a bit of bilge X, Cuprinel bilge X, one of my favourite uh, products for use around the boat. Just a little cupful, not, don't need much, especially when the bilges aren't that dirty. And then we're going to fill it up until the automatic bilge pump goes off. There it is, that's the alarm and the bilge pump on the automatic. You've got to put a bit more in to make sure that it's actually, because that was just literally the float switch lifting up and then turning off again. So we need to put a bit more in before it'll stay open for long enough to give a, a proper flush out. There you go. So good news that the float switch works. Let's just test the actual manual version of this. All good there. So having done the electric uh, one, we're going to test the uh, the manual one now, and um, that's here. Both pumps tested, um, and I've had a good sponge out and a good clean out in here. So now we can have a little look and inspection. So that's the automatic float switch. That is the strum box for the electric one. And then this side is the strum box for the manual. So you can see the filter there. And actually this one is movable so that you can move it around um, so that you can see the end of the pipe there. The engine bilge is in here. So beneath the engine is the engine sump, um, where engine oil collects. Now I normally um, keep a part of this on board, but I ran out last time, and uh, so there is a cheaper alternative, but it doesn't absorb oil. So you need to use your spill absorbing pad uh, and the other stuff. And so what we've got is, we've got cat litter that absorbs the water and um, oil absorbent pad. And so uh, we've soaked up any oil that was in there uh, when we did the last oil change. So now it's had time to soak up, uh, a day or so, I'm going to uh, scoop it all out and take it up to the oil dump. And when you're going to do a messy job, you want some nice gauntlets, uh, useful for any foul task aboard the boat. Um, and uh, these have come in handy many a time. Well, disgusting task all completed, and as you can see, the engine bilge is now quite clean. Um, so what we need to do is put a new pad in. We take some of this spill sub absorbent pad, good stuff, and um, we need not quite half of this actually. About an A4 sheet under there. We can put that into there. And then now we can see that's now nice and white. And next time we have a look and we've run the engine for a bit, if there's any spots on there, we've got an oil leak and it's nice and easy to spot.
rest of the world, the tide uh, rises and then falls. Um, and it usually does that around about two times each day, or every six and a half hours up, and then six and a half hours down. And um, it doesn't do that in Southampton. Um, it rises and it stays risen, and we have a double high water stand. Let's look at tidal flow through the English Channel. The south coast of England is just the right length to mean it's pretty much high water at Land's End when it's low water at Dover, and vice versa. The tide is an oscillating wave, and weirdly the effects of the gravitational pulls of sun and moon act in such a way that Southampton is at the centre of this wave, which, if the coastline and seabed were completely flat, would mean there'd be almost no tidal rise at all. But add in the Isle of Wight and the Cherbourg Peninsula, and suddenly we have a constriction in both width and depth that create friction and force the water to rise out of sync with the main tidal wave. Add in the two entrances to the Solent, the constriction in flow at the western entrance caused by the Hurst Narrows, the relatively shallow water in the Solent and Southampton water, and the tidal obstruction caused by the Bramble Bank right in the middle of the Solent, and it's easy to see why things get quite messed up. The practical upshot of this is that we have special tidal curves from Christchurch to Selsey Bill. First, there's a young flood stand that occurs a couple of hours after low water, where the water rises, pauses and then rises again. Then the first high water, a slight drop and then another high water peak. All this takes about nine hours, which means the ebb tide lasts just three and a half hours. And as you can see from the flow around the boat, here on the upper reaches of the Itchen, it's pretty fierce. Down here, even with the wind blowing, we've got some signs that the tide is running, flooding in. As you can see, it's quite definitely low water here, but this is right up inside the marina, whereas we're quite way out into the river. Very, very small amount of tidal movement coming towards us now, and it's half past, half an hour after low water. On this side, a little bit more flow but there's also a bit of breeze going with us as well so it's hard to tell for definite ready yeah okay there you are okay Walking back as well I love spending time in Southampton. It's a gateway to the world, with the largest cruise ships and container ships coming and going, importing everything you can possibly imagine. And it's also the spiritual home of the Cunard Queens. The Queen Mary too was in 38.9 berth, so I nipped round Dockhead to take a few pictures. Seeing the QM2 in Southampton takes me back to the January of 2004 and the night we watched her depart on a maiden voyage. I had my mother on board. She'd sailed on the original Queen Mary and has since sailed on the QM2. But that night, watching the fireworks from our little yacht right under the bows of the biggest ocean liner in the world and the sound of that horn, well, that was one of those life experiences you can never forget.
By contrast, I positively hate the journey up Southampton water, constantly being rolled by an almost continuous stream of high-powered motor yachts that create quite dangerous wakes if they pass too close, and annoyingly they quite often do. If you do have a motor yacht, please be considerate of the effect your wake might have on the other vessels as you pass them by.